Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to World at War Comics. I have two legends in the industry, Mr. Larry Stroman, Mr. Todd Johnson, creators and the, the writers and the artists of Tribe, 30-year anniversary. Cannot wait to hear about all the amazing things that are about to take place. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. I'm really excited to talk to both of you. Woo-woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good intro. I uh, appreciate that. I'm I'm, I'm really excited uh, to talk to both of you um, seriously uh, and what you've all accomplished over the last 30 years, um, what Tribe means to comic books and the importance of Tribe. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it came out a, a few months um, right before Milestone, which made its huge impact within the industry. So I think when we talk about African-American characters and what this means in comic books, um, to have that 30 year anniversary hit and uh, some of the things that uh, you're about to do with Tribe because of that 30 years, I think is extremely important. And uh, I can't wait to find out more about it. You know, 30 years gives you a long rest to come up with a whole bunch of uh, <laughs> flesh out all the ideas from 30 years ago, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, can, can you kind of give us a, a little bit of a background, maybe start with Tribe, how the idea of Tribe came um, in 1993, um, how you two came together and the development of Tribe, and then we could kind of work through a little bit of your history, if that's okay? Sure. Absolutely. Well, I was uh, I was working on X Factor. X Factor. <laughs> and I don't know what to do. I'm like, I don't know what else I wanted to work on. And I got an, and at the time, Image was, Image was doing their thing, and they asked me if I would be interested in doing a book over there, and I was like, yeah, I guess so. I have nothing else to do. <laughs> and then I, I had no idea what I was going to do. And then one day, me and Todd were talking, because we had already been friends, and I said, want to do a comic book? And he was like, Sure. He didn't have any. He didn't have any previous experience of doing comics or anything, and I haven't had any experience of writing comics. So we were just going to try to figure out as we went along, like most people would figure out when they do their own little independent thing. Except ours ended up being just a little bit more than just like the run of the mill independent book, because it just happened to kind of come right around the same time of like the height of when people were. You know, really in the comics and buying comics, and that kind of a thing. So it worked out really well for us, or at least you know, for a little while. <laughs> Time and chance, right? Exactly. Time and chance. Team. Well, you know, you had you had like the collectors market, you had the speculators market, and you just had fandom all kind of meet in like a just a uh, you know a centerpiece right then in the early '90s, and you hear people talk about it all the time, and. You know, it's not like all of the books started selling. You still had to have something that, you know, piqued somebody's interest. And we just happened to be one of those books. And well, well, the people act as if we just went, we just did this book and then it did well and all that kind of stuff. We actually spent about eight months pounding the pavement, traveling around, everything. I mean, we barely even had any money during that process. And and like I said, when this came out, it came out eight months after we had actually started the book. Part of the thing, like you said earlier, is like we really didn't have necessarily tribe in mind. We just had a book in mind that came from conversations about the th type of things we liked in comics. You know, so then the, tri the tribe name actually came after the characters and such. You know, we did say we wanted to do a team book. But, you know, we just kept going around and asking people what they like and showing people drawings and things like that. And as we slowly started naming the characters, Tribe came much later. So calling the book Tribe, even some of the, some of the other names that you throw out at first are used by somebody else. Or somebody, you know, even, even amongst the image guys themselves finding out that, oh, you can't use that, we're going to use that, or or we got a book coming out called Shadow This or, or Wet That or, you know, that you know, so we're all over the place trying to come up with right names like yourself that you're you know that you're talking to like and the company that you're about to put it up you know that them and other companies aren't already using something very close. But well, the name thing is not as easy as people think. Oh, with this name, oh, I came with that name. I was like, dude, it's been used before. Yeah. Oh no, that's an original name. 
<laughs> Matter of fact, we had to go hire, we had to uh, hi, uh, hire this company to search at the time, because we didn't really have the internet at the time, to search around to see if these names that we had, if the characters in the name of the book were strictly ours. Yeah, which is a, you know, you have to imagine in 1993, you're talking about no internet, no social media, none of the other aspects that you have of doing this stuff. So it's all like you have to you have to pay or go do the library and search yourself. And even then, you still hit things that are similar. Yeah. So it's just a matter of are you, are you going to be legally able to defend yourself or are they going to be, a, you know, legally able to you know, attack you? Sometimes there's many companies that have names that are similar or the same and they just say, ah, oh, whatever. You know, the character is a little bit different or a little bit, you know, Nobody worries about. It, you and know? then the thing is that there are only so many powers that they could be in a superhero comic book. So you have to figure out how do you take that standard, those standard powers, and turn it into something interesting. Yeah, I think that's where uh, some of the and it's not as easy as. We... <laughs> yeah, I think that's where some of like the character development and the personalities and all that become extremely important, right? Because again if you run fast, right, there's, there's a lot of characters that run really fast. So there, there's got to be a lot more um, about the character from a cultural standpoint to uh, their daily life, which um, I believe uh, you both did extremely well. And uh, I think that's why that the popularity of some of these characters that were uh, in tribe uh, really resonated with a lot of people. So, um, so, so it's like, if you, uh -huh. Say, for instance, you, you, you have a character who runs fast, and you're like, well, what more can I do with this character that runs fast? Well, it's like, well, what if I took the character and I made him kind of a short dude? Because you don't see fast fat, uh, fast dudes that are short. Yeah. And you could say, well, you know, let's make his personality the bully that used to pick on trouble with me when I was going to grade school. <laughs> and then oh, uh, and then you could take these two names from two people, other people that you went to high school with, and then you add add that into uh, he might be a drug addict. He might be it could be any number of things. You're thinking, man, what would it like be like for, for a guy to be able to move that fast? But he's a bully. What kinds of terrible stuff would he would he do to people? You know? Yeah. And yeah. that's that's how you come up with interesting characters. Yeah. You know? And that's and that's how you also stay away from people saying, "Oh, yeah, I got Write a character. Down, right? I got yeah. a character just like that." Write that down. We can Write right. that down. There you go. You heard it here first. Huh? <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> fast guy. We're gonna do that. One. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's literally how this stuff comes up. With you know, you're just talking back and forth and joking about what you like or joking with other people, and out of that comes something that's interesting that you can then kind of flesh out and see where it goes. You know. And you know the nice thing about comics. I mean, you read comics, you play toys, and you can go in any direction you want, man. And if it's not working, you just introduce another character, or you kill off a character, or the character just disappears and loses a fight in one issue. I mean, if you read any of the all the comics that we've looked at over the years, there's characters that stuck. You know, you come back and back and forth like a Doctor Doom or a Magneto. But there's just there's ten times as many characters that you saw in that one issue. You never the Equinox Man or <laughs> Turn of the Century. You never see him again because it didn't catch on or whatever. So that's the uniqueness about comics, man. You can use your imagination to whatever the hell you want to do. Yeah, and that's cool. Yeah, unfortunately, one of the unfortunate parts of it is because you're on a deadline of having to get things done at a certain time. Sometimes you don't really get to do what you want to do with the character. You just have to kind of throw stuff together really fast. Yeah, yeah. Now, as far as the, the storyline, where the story takes uh, place, um, like what aspects of tribe before you had the tribe name did you already have done you talked about you had some characters already did you already know what the villains were going to be where it was going to take place um how you wanted these characters to interact before you had the name tribe we, we actually didn't have the characters what we had was just a series of stories that we had been telling each other about people that we knew and we just say well, what if, what if you can have a guy who does this but he's this guy you know so, and then part of it, we at that time, Brian was living in Brooklyn, so we already knew we were based in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and and New York as a basis for just comics. Period, always been just kind of the centerpiece for American comics. So people are more familiar with some of the 
build if you if you decide to be realistic and have an actual building in the background, people are already familiar with it. And when you say that you have this is the central comic company team that everybody kind of knows from huge cities and all things like that. You don't have to suspend belief that a lot of crazy stuff could go on that everybody else doesn't know about. Mm-hmm. You know, if you put it in some small city. What's the chance that there's a big fight, but all the other heroes and all the villains didn't know about it? And so because of the size, you know, you know, when you look at, at, at New York on a map, it doesn't take up a lot of space, but there's so much stuff that goes on in there, in that, in that little bit of space, that depending on where you're at in different parts of the, of the boroughs, you would have no idea what's going on in the other part. Yeah. I mean, I remember people that I spoke to who live in the Bronx that have never been to Manhattan their entire life because everything they need is in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And people that live in Brooklyn, everything they need is there. So to travel is something you have to kind of go out of your way to do. Well, it's really not even traveling. It's just you hop on a train and 40 minutes later you're in Manhattan, you know? So part part of the central location was going to be New York, but as we we kind of announced in the beginning that we were going to have 200 different characters because that was all the things we had fleshed out in our head over the time. And some of those characters would be from all over the country, all over the world. But, you know, we ended up doing four issues. So obviously, you know, we haven't fleshed out introducing all the other aspects outside of New York or other things. That are I, going I, lived in, I lived in, well, I first lived in uh, New York for about 15 years. And in that 15 years, I probably knew maybe five people all together that actually was born there. Everybody else came from some other country or from some other city. Yep. And almost nobody, almost nobody was actually from New York. <clears throat> and that's the thing. You think of every kind of character that you, you've grown up on. I mean, behind you, you have a whole row of Green Lantern Corps. Okay. They all come from different planets. Uh, different sectors, yep. different backgrounds, and then their families are all different things. That was built out because we've had 40, 50, 60 years of the Green Lantern mythos. Okay, that's a thing. When you're doing comics, you have to get some issues behind you to start building up this, this, this full range of stuff that we all love. Almost every character behind you has decades of issues, hundreds of issues for you to know that we, we now know for some characters just as much about the character and his powers as we know who his brother is, father, uh, the people he works with, the, the church he goes to. It's, it's funny. So you really just have to have the time to build out the, the layers and the depth of your characters, which, you know, that's, what, that's why we're back. We're going to explore all that. <laughs> so over these last 30 years, you've kind of already added onto those stories to be able to go into that kind of depth and to bring forth some of those other 200 characters then? Yeah, definitely. But of course, we're going to start with issue five. (laughs) (laughs) You still want to get like 20 something pages to do what you're going to do. So we don't want to start trying to pack in. We're not trying to, uh, this is not something we're trying to make up for 30 years. Yeah. We're going to start. We're going to start right where we left off. I mean, we're not going to try to give you a three hundred page volume to catch up with. This is meanwhile, you know, no, it's not going to be like that. Yeah, yeah. We're no. just going to take take what we had and expand it from there. And we want to bridge the gap between what we consider our old fans. Hopefully, drag some of them along with us and 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 meet new fans on the way. Yeah, that's so exciting. I, I think a lot of people are going to be. Uh, uh, beside themselves when they see uh, that these characters are coming back together again and stories are going to be added. Now, uh, you you started off with Image. As far as the publishing goes for this uh, issue five, where where is it going to be published? Is it going to be self-published or are you back with Image again? Uh, right now, it's self-published. That's the plan. Yeah. We just decided to, uh, I think it's best for us and our personalities and what we like to do is just to kind of what it, the system. best thing about it used to be back in the day that the people that did the self-published was considered like bottom of the barrel types because they weren't able to get work working for the mainstream uh, companies or whatever. Now everybody's looking forward to self-publishing. Even the top guys in the business, 
it's just like, hey, if I didn't wasn't making as much money as I was doing doing the jobs that I'm doing now, I would be publishing my own stuff. So it's become a normal thing that that's what people aspire to do nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're so, seeing. So uh, the other thing too is, you might sell a lower amount of books because you're not a Marvel or DC, but it's yours. You own it. You do whatever you want with it. Make all the money back, whatever whatever the money amount, amount of money that it is. There's a movie deal that comes up or whatever. You don't have to go through another company in order to make that happen. You can just do that yourself. As well as no... Uh, like that care. I don't want that character to kill somebody or I don't want that character to do this part of the Time for you to put this type of character in there. So, you know, your your agenda is your own agenda. I had a, I had a friend who will remain nameless right now. He, he could tell you that story when he decides. But I have a friend of mine who his dream was to always have his creator own character at one of the big companies. So eventually he got that. That came true. And he accepted the character and all that kind of stuff. And then I had said to him, I said, you do know now that that's not yours anymore. And he says, oh, no, I got these great ideas. I'm going to tell them to do this and tell them that. I said, it's not yours anymore. Yeah. Once they buy it, they do whatever they want. And since that time, they've been doing whatever they want with it. He has no say so on anything. Yeah. And that's why it's so important when you're doing the books for yourself, try to hold on to it as long as you can. Yeah. Yeah. You're seeing a somewhat of a renaissance. You have, like you said, I mean, Jeff Johns and uh, Peter Tomasi and Brian Hitch, all these all these amazing creators just created Ghost Machine with the purpose of anything and everything they do. It's all creator owned and they're going to share in the profits of that, right? You have Scott Snyder who left DC and he's doing a lot of creator owned stuff. So yeah, Larry, I think you are, I mean, what you're bringing up, you're seeing so many amazing creators go off and do Kickstarters and, and uh, you know, fund my comic and Indiegogo for that purpose, right? And there's- And listen, so you, got, you got guys- raising money yeah. on 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 these kickstarter things they're getting paid more money now than they ever did when they were at the at printing less books yeah getting more money back than those that small amount of books yep. because of their relationship with the with fans and stuff out there and that's what the internet has opened up that is you know if you dream big enough or you're willing to put in the work you can make the same opportunities for yourself or even more than you had just working with them. Yeah, the, the you know, you know, when you're doing that, like with us, we have people waiting to buy the book yeah. because they like us, not because we necessarily did anything for them, but because they like us. You know, they, we socialized over the years, you know, the internet of meeting us at conventions or whatever, and and they want to buy it for that reason. And think about this. Think about this difference, Thomas. And back in the '90s. You could either get a, a preview like on uh, Comics Buyer's Guide or Wizard or something like that, or you could buy something in the distributor thing, like Apple or Diamond. Okay, where would a guy like you even fit in? That we're now on a channel on YouTube or on podcast channels, however you can do this conversation that goes live and lives on the internet for as long as you decide. Do you yeah. have any of your comics in front of you? I'm sorry? Do you have any of your comics in front of you? I do. It's right here. I just I just finished my issue two right here. Here's Kingsville right here. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Nice. Now we're going to interview you now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, when did you get started? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> well, it wasn't 30 years ago, Larry. That's for sure. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, I, I listen, listen. We were we we were in a store talking to a guy who said he uh, he met me at a show when he was eight years old. I'm looking at this dude. I'm not. This dude looked like he my age. <laughs> how, how did he meet me when he was eight years old? <laughs> so how did you get in yourself as far as wanting to publish? I mean, you know, just being a, a comic book fan for a very long time. Um, you know, the pandemic put us all in the house. Um, and then I, I had some health issues, which led to a, a kidney replacement. So I was out of work for about seven months. And during that time, I was driving my wife crazy. 
um, just being around the house, not able to work. And um, she knows how much I love comic books. And I've had this story in my head for a while. And she said, you know, and I'm also 50 years old, almost 50. I'll be a 50 in another year. So uh, and my kids are all adults now. And she said, well, if you're going to do it, now's the time to do it, right? You, you could afford to do it now because you have less responsibility with the children. And so that's what I did. I, I threw it together. Yeah, huh? Obviously, during the pandemic, that's what led you to launch the book. Yeah. But what made you then decide, OK, I'm going to I'm gonna do a whole TV channel. I'm going to do my whole <laughs> podcast thing, everything. Yeah. You know, creating a comic book today is easier than it ever was before. It's not cheap, it still takes a lot of hard work, but you have all these printers across the US that you could utilize like Comic no, Wellspring. And no, the thing is, it's not easier, it's simpler. Simpler, that's a good point. Still like, hard, it's still hard to do. Still it's hard just, to do, you're absolutely right. you have right. access to a lot of stuff you didn't have before. Exactly, no, that's 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 such a good point. It is, it's simpler to do, still very hard to do. I made a lot of mistakes um, for sure trying to do it. You know, did a lot of research trying to figure out how to put it all together. Um, trying to find an artist because I'm not an artist um, was not easy. Um, I've, I've been burned a few times going through the internet using Fiverr and stuff like that, trying to find an artist. It, it's very difficult um, to find a really good partner. And when you do, right, you want to hold on because you're like, man, I hope that uh, they don't get noticed and, and go somewhere else. Although if that <laughs> happens, I'd be very happy with Dan, who is our artist. But uh, yeah, it, it was very difficult to get started. And I thought, well, I love comic books. Um, I have all these amazing creators that I've been reading for, you know, 30, 35 years. I started reading comics when I was about 14 years old. Um, I said, let's let me see if I could start a podcast and maybe some of them will come on. We'll just have a conversation. So it would be twofold. One, I could highlight the indie comics scene because I do think indie comics is where it's at right now. I'm a huge DC fan, love Marvel, um, but all the best stories I feel are coming out of indie comics because DC and Marvel are limited due to, you know, 80 years of that character, right? You're, you're not going to see Superman have some weird power and you're not going to see Batman starting to fly, right? That's just not ever going to happen. But in indie comics, there are no rules. It's your creation. You could do whatever you want right. and we're seeing amazing stories come out of that so i wanted to highlight indie comics because i love indie comics um but two selfishly by having these conversations i'm learning how to be a better writer and a better creator through these mm -hmm. conversations so it was twofold one i wanted to highlight indie comics because i love them but two i also wanted to get better at the craft and the best way to do that is to talk to folks like you that have that experience so that I was really the motivation when i got out of uh when I was in high school, I uh, had a lot of curiosity about architecture. So I ended up uh, um, getting into this program. It was like a, a work school program. I go to school half the day and go to work the rest of the time. And so I got to learn about engineering. I got to learn about architecture. And I was getting paid to do it. Then when I left that, I, and I went, to, to uh, go to New York to pursue an art career, I couldn't really figure out what to do. So I ended up just selling my art out on the street. But I was still making money. I'm making a little bit of money, but I've been making money selling art. And then I started doing portraits. So I learned how to get better at drawing faces and stuff. And I was getting paid for that. And then I eventually graduated into actually doing comic books. So I always tell people, my whole education as an artist, I got paid to do it. I said, and that's that's what you should, should, you know, try to do if you possibly can. And that's the good thing about how the Internet and stuff works now. You can actually, if you're an artist, you can sell art on your same page while you're trying to sell your comic book. Exactly. Well, that's, what's nice. that's what's nice what you've done here, too, though. You know, you opened up different streams of, of connection and synergy of what you're trying to do because you... You bring up more awareness of yourself as a creator. You also are bringing up more awareness of the book that you have or your company, and you're selling the brand of what your you know your channel is, yeah. and and who you meet on the way is the collaboration that you get, whether you collaboration on a comic and stuff. That's so. What I'm saying is what what you did was brilliant, and uh, <laughs> good luck with everything. <laughs> I appreciate it. You know? you know, most people would not want to grind that hard. 
do it, but to what level and what reach? You know, you you know, it's the difference between being local, regional, national, and worldwide. Yeah. Which one do you want? Yeah. That's 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 on you. You know, so obviously you've already taken it worldwide by putting up a channel. So I salute you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I I, I absolutely love getting the opportunity to to meet um, gentlemen like you and to be able to pick your brains. And uh, <laughs> it's just so fun, man. It's it's just wild to think that uh, some of the, the folks that you've read or you've seen their art in comic books as you're growing up, now you're sitting down in front of a computer and having a conversation with them. It's a little surreal sometimes, but uh, it's absolutely amazing. And like you, you said, Todd, I mean, without the Internet, right, none of these type of things would happen, right? I, I would have to be in Detroit somewhere if that's where you still live, but I'd have to be yep. there, right? And I would have to find you at a Comic-Con and then I'd have to yep. have my little recorder like in the old days and tape our conversation yeah. you wouldn't see the the facial expressions you wouldn't see the reactions you wouldn't like now all of a sudden people could just dive into the emotion that goes behind the creation that you both have brought forth in tribe and then 30 years later see that excitement of being able to bring forth issue five and all the different like none of this happens without this and uh, it's just i don't know i i feel like there's good and bad in that right but i think on the good side Man, it's just incredible for people to have that feeling and that sense of pride and everything that goes into that. You just don't get that unless you're seeing this visually, I don't think. Well, that's the thing back in the day, like with Tribe, you you made it or break it just by individual comic stores deciding how many issues they were going to pour. Yeah. So how do you reach all these guys? How do you reach these people to show them what you're all about or what you plan or it's something they'd be interested in? They just open up one little page in a book and see a little synopsis that might have been one sentence. And they'd say, ah, I'm going to try five. And if five sell out, they might not even think, oh, okay, this time I'll reorder 10. They might think, oh, that book, I didn't sell that many of them. Well, that's all you ordered. Why are you just well, because that? they're glad that they sold what they had, so they're not going to take the chance of getting any more. Exactly. Yeah. So now the internet kind of makes the way you can promote beyond that one sentence blurb now you know you see everybody like yourself or us or anybody everybody's on their own social media platforms like basically pt Barnum now yeah. look at what i got look what i'm doing you know you get to explain it you get to talk about it, you get to visually show it you can do whatever you want now. i remember i had a I had this art i needed to uh send out one weekend and um uh, so i go down to the post office and it never even occurred to me so i got to the post office but one of the packages went to Canada. The other package went to India. I mean, I'm sorry, England. And the other pa package went to Pakistan. I never thought, am I, I never thought I would ever be sending anything to Pakistan. It's like, for well, what? Because they got comic fans there too, like everywhere exactly. else. <laughs> and that's where your website comes in. I'm sure you've already seen it as well. You didn't kind of watch it in LA somewhere. See, man, I've got a guy watching my show in London. Yeah. I've got somebody just, you know, is watching in Chicago, California. I mean, it's like it's kind of wild that the, the 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 data that you have now to figure out where you are. A guy comes up, walks up to me outside of a show. Nice to meet you. He says, me and my brother were like fans of your stuff. We've been following you stuff for a long time. And he says, he says, I have my 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 uh my brother here on the phone. He's in Iceland. Yeah. And he says, I mean, he just wants to say hello. I mean, <laughs> Iceland? I'm like. There are comics in Iceland. Apparently, there are. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's something you would have never had access to, other than, like you said, you'd have to go to a brick and mortar shop or or to a show. Now, you you really don't have to leave your home if you don't but want the, to. But like, I did a cover. I did a cover to some book, and they're in a rush to get this cover done. So I penciled it, and then it was sent to an uh, uh, to an anchor in England. I mean, uh, in uh, New Jersey. And the colorist is in England, and then the letter was in some other country somewhere, and all this was done in a period of probably two less than two days. Yeah, yeah. Been, that was like unheard of in a day. You know, just just mailing it would take long. There's an interesting book you should read, Thomas. It's called yeah. "The World Is Flat." Yes, I've read it. Yeah, now I that have. pretty much talked about this dynamic that we're in now. That you know, it's. You don't have to think of yourself as like I'm in this room right here and that's all I got. Man, right. you it's like we are all like the wizard of Oz now, man. We're all 
all like we're behind the curtain pushing our things and we got the big fiery face on the internet. Oh, I'm very powerful. That's what everybody's doing now. You don't know the size. You don't need the scope. You don't know, you know how much finances they have. You can, if you can get out there yeah. and push yourself forward, you know, you can make yourself big until you can, you know, they can take it to you make. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> this is the story of my life, my friends. Story of my but that's, life. A, I, that's one of the things I think is unfortunate about a lot of people that that pursue doing uh, independent books is that they don't understand that part that involves them. They know there's all these various things you can do to get this done and get that done, but when it comes to actually selling it, that's where their weakness is at because they don't know how to then take this thing that they've made these copies of and actually get other people uh, to buy it. And that's where the whole personality thing comes in and that kind of thing. A lot of people, unfortunately, that's not something you can read in a book. No. They also don't understand that they have the, there's all the elements and tools are now available for the small guy. The, you know, the internet is no bigger for the big guy than it is for the small guy. It's the same internet. You know, websites and URLs are the same. Yours is the same as mine. You know, we all can get on Facebook. We can all do a TikTok. We can do whatever we want. Now, how you expand it from there, that's where they have advantages. You know, because most people won't dig in and read more more and what you just said was very important like you get to you're getting to meet all these people you said one thing very important about picking other people's brains don't don't be afraid to ask some questions to find out best practices from somebody else you know and then you know take that and go further when i first when i first decided to come into comics i went to the shows and i went right straight to the top whoever the most popular guy was there i went right directly to that guy i didn't have to you know, people say, excuse me, sir, you have to wait in line. I'm not waiting in line. Move out the way. And I go around and go right up there and I talk to him, that guy was because, because that knowledge that he had inside of his head, I wanted that so bad. And I'm just like, in order for me to do this, I got to get what this guy has. Now, we're not suggesting you push people out of the way, Thomas, but <laughs> but if you if you want to, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> who's going to stop you want, right and you got to be you, aggressive you, you look and, like and a pretty bold. formidable guy yourself you know why you? <laughs> <laughs> there were a number of guys that i've known of big time guys in the business that start off just just being irritating to people they'd hang they go and hang around some office enough that they like who is this guy you know Oh, he's just a guy who wants an interview. Well, give him an interview because I'm tired of him sitting in the lobby all the time. Yeah. You know, that guy ends up getting his first work. Persistence, right? Persistence is important, you know. <laughs> but you know, when we're talking about that uh, that persistence, right? It, it's you gotta you gotta know what you want, um, and you have to be willing to fight for it. And uh, to your point, Larry, whether that's bumping people out of the way to get to that person that you know has the knowledge and the path. Um, for you that you need to take, then that's what you got to do. And uh, those people that are willing to do that, um, they're the ones that usually are able to break through, right? And then to you, you ever watch? You ever watch? Uh, uh, Tank. Say that one more time. Shark Tank. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, the black dude on there, he had this company called Fubo. Mm -hmm. So what he did in the early days, he'd have these T-shirts and hats and stuff made up. And he would just go places and he would just give the give these things out to people. Mm. For one particular day, he was he was at some event or something, and he kind of pushes his way through the crowd because these different uh people in the music industry were walking down this hallway. So L L Cool J just happens to be coming that way, and he jumps right in front of everybody and hands this hat and the shirt to L L Cool J. So L L Cool J ends up wearing it at one point. And that was their springboard to start their business. And then they end up with this like multi-zillion dollar business that went on for years. The word is audacity. Yeah. So sometimes it takes that, it, this, that you, you have to, the thing is, if you don't push yourself out there, nobody, nobody's going to do that for you. I see people sitting up at shows all the time with stacks of books that they publish and they're just kind of sitting there and nobody's buying nothing from them because they don't know how to sell the book. Yeah, and what do you, and what do you do about those cliche things that people tell you like uh, it's it's going to be your time or wait your turn or you know somebody's going to call why why do you have to wait for 
Why can't you take your own destiny? See, on most people forward? believe that all you have to do is just make the product and that's it. And that's just one part. That's one part of the whole process. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of like if you want to be interviewed on a podcast about your comic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should, should I have waited until it rotates around that you thought about maybe calling up? Or mm -hmm. should I just contact you and see how it works? And then you have a conversation and then here we are. Yeah. So just which person are you? Are you to wait, wait in line, wait your turn, or is it the hey, try to try to make something happen? You could have still say it's still your choice to say no or yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if I never reached out, I don't even get that chance. I have to wait till you might. Or you might just think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Such a good point. Yep. Well, gentlemen. Can we talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that you are about to do? I've been watching some of your videos and some of your unboxing. We got 30 year anniversary issue five. Like what can you kind of tell us about 30 years later? And we kind of talked about what's different today than it was back then. But as far as where we're at right now, what can we expect with tribe uh, moving forward? Well, here's, here's the thing that's interesting is that over a period of, of time, it's like, oh, I think this would be a cool idea. Oh, I think this would be a good thing to do, whatever. And you make little notes and, and, and that kind of thing. And then and then somewhere along the line, when you finally decide to put it all together and, and make this book, you look at you look at a lot of stuff and you say, man, it's like three years ago when I first came up with this idea, people were still using phones with a cord on it. And now nobody uses those kind of phones anymore. There were there were there were fax machines and nobody uses fax machines. Everybody used to live for having a VHS player and a, and, a, and a DVD player, and people don't have those anymore for the most part. So you have to you have to update a lot of what it is that you're doing, or have some kind of excuse as to why it's it's still there. Like me, I like drawing people wearing different types of clothes from different time periods. So I could do a crowd scene where somebody would be wearing a bell-bottom pants and then they'll be wearing some baggy pants and then somebody else has like skinny jeans on. And it's like, it's just all fun just to put all this stuff together. But I mean, I'm sure people look at me and like, man, what time does this even take place? I can't tell by what people wear. Because that's how I see the world is that there's a lot of stuff. Some stuff goes out date. Some stuff is still cool. And then this is stuff you just like yourself. So I still continue to try to fit that stuff in. And, that, and that's how the story goes, to try to pick it up where we left off. Obviously, we've had to relook at scripts and look at situations and say, hey, that maybe that joke's not funny anymore. Or maybe that's a little off color. You know, the world has changed as far as, uh, you know, the politics and things you can say. You know, some jokes aren't funny anymore. It's not unlike, shall we say, you know, so... We've had to, you know, you have to toe the line a little bit to tie in the, the fans that, you know, put you where you were in the first place to where the world is now. So I think we've done a good job in like chopping it up over, you know, getting the issue five done of bringing, you know, hard and fast everybody from before into exactly what we're doing now and then try to pick up a pace from there to, you know, take you to where how we think now you're talking about some guys that were in the 30 somethings versus some guys that are in the 60 somethings. So even how we individually think as creators is no longer the same. What we think, you know, what he wants to draw. All that has to change. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like recently, recently I haven't seen a lot of drawings that people have been doing of uh, having to do it. The Thundercats cartoon and in my mind, I'm still thinking of this cartoon that came out what, back in the 80s or whenever it was yeah. that it came out. So it's still just this kid program that was that was on. But then now I'm realizing that those kids who were fans of that, they're like in their 30s or 40s now, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's no longer just a kid's thing. It's, it's just, just like with us, with cartoons that we like, that now it's just these uh these iconic, you know, things. 
But, but that's how you have to look at your property too. Even the target market that we were dealing with, the age of them now, what they're going to think is going to be something more palatable. We have <laughs> got to figure that out again, right? You know, and so it's it's going to be trial and error, man. You know, you figure it's going to be one book at a time. We put out a book, and if it, you know, you know you'll watch. The nice thing about now, you're not waiting three months to find out what people think of yourself. As soon as you put it out, man, you go to the internet and you could just Google your name, and there's going to be all all sorts of ranges of hate to to love to everything in between. So you can you can you'll know whether a joke work you'll know whether a page work you know, it's, it's like i do a particular piece of art and then i post it and within that hour 40 50 people have responded to it it's like that's that's a weird kind of thing in your mind it's just like man it used to be might have been one two people at the show or something like that now it's like in that shorter period of time that many people are telling me what they think about something yeah, it's funny that you noticed the unboxing because that's something, you know, when you've been around a long time, you could do stuff like that. You find some box for just on it. <laughs> full of some brand new comics. That's exciting to people. So we, we, we're, we're going to try to take all of our strengths as far as, you know, the legacy and the history of what we know, but then you still have to put it together with all the new school methods now. It can't be, you know, you can't not have a, a Facebook or not have an Instagram. And take the, you know, you we're gonna have to do everything, you know. So it's like it's a learning curve. Yeah. That's what yeah. you could do. We want you to make everybody know the vibe. Say that one more time again, Todd. Sorry, you broke up. That's where you come in. We want you to let everybody know on the internet to buy the book. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll be more than happy to do that, my friends. More than happy. <laughs> more than happy. Now, can we talk a little bit? I mean, obviously, you know, 30 years later, we go back to 1993. From a representation standpoint, right, um, Black characters, at a minimum, you come out with Tribe right after that milestone. And now you look 30 years later, do you think that uh, that representation has gotten better or do you still think it's uh, sorely lacking within comic books? I think it's definitely gotten better. I mean, you can, you know, it doesn't take just comics to see that. You can look at television, radio, you know, movies, everything. Well, it used to be you had a handful of guys who were writers or artists, usually much older guys, doing portrayals of stuff that people might have wanted to see, you know. I, and I want to see more black characters. I want to see more Asian characters. I want to see whatever. So usually the guys that did these were guys who did it because it was part of a job that they had. But, you know, it'd be like a guy who's like 75 years old who has no clue what it, what it is he's doing his book about. And he's just doing the book, which, which is OK, but it still doesn't really represent the people who wanted to represent them. So now what you have, because of how everything is, everybody can do their own thing. People can do their own representation and send it out to the world so that everybody can see whatever it is. And the, and the cultural representation does not necessarily mean just the character. Now it means the theme scene as well. So that is something that we hit in the early 90s, being uh, two African-American gentlemen putting out African-American product. That... You know, we, we weren't thinking of like trying to do a black comic. We are black dudes. Exactly. So we just did what we wanted to do. We're just trying to do a good comic. It, it's society that starts putting these labels like gender and race and sexuality on that kind of stuff. Those are just those are just labels people try to put on it. We were just trying to do a good comic. We weren't thinking about this character's gonna be black, this character's gonna be tall, this character's gonna, you know, that's just politics. You know, that that's Sometimes that stands in the way of true creativity. You know, just doing what you want is what you should be doing. And then hopefully, you know, you do something you like and then your fan base finds you, not the other way around that, you know, you 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 pull out a page or paper or a newspaper and you say, okay, this is what's popular now. We're going to do uh, uh, three female characters, two black characters, one Mexican character. You know, that's, you're trying to create, you know. Have I got this creativity. I just had a post the other day where I asked the question, why do people uh, still design characters that have masks on their face? And most people have no idea even why they do it. 
You do it because that's what you've always seen your whole life. So you assume if I'm going to do a superhero character, his his costume has to be tight. He has a, has a logo on his chest. He has to have a cape and he has to have glasses. So it's like, man, there's a million different ways you can design those characters. It doesn't, you don't have to cover his face all the time because we're not even in that kind of a thing anymore. Now it's just all, all it just all has become just symbolic, you know? So it's like, it's kind of like the Superman thing. I mean, you're still being sold on the thing that nobody knows he's Clark Kent because he has these glasses on. So you already have a suspension of belief for that type of thing. So I think that goes back to what Larry was saying. What are these little uh, the diamond mask, like a, like a green lantern? Or, you can see the whole face. I mean, I could get a character like a Spider-Man or something. Okay, his whole face is covered or something. But people with the glasses and the little, the little tiny, come on, man, you know. And again, you just do it because that's what you've always seen. So you just do your variation of what what has been there before. Somebody does a somebody does a character that takes place back in the 30s or 40s. There's always a guy with a suit with with a tie, and he got the the the, the diamond shaped thing covering his face and a hat. What do you and call so, that? Donald it's going to go up. It's like because that's all the superheroes look back then, you know. <clears throat> So nobody goes off uh, off script, basically. People had said to it always said to me, "Oh, I really like the way you design you know, the the X Factor costumes and stuff." And it's like, well, it, we never really seen much like that before. Where did you get that from? And I said the very first thing I did when I started to design those is I went to like these really odd stores. Now you have access to most of that stuff now, but back then I'd go to these stores and they would have these sections where they would have. European fashion magazines and stuff. And I would go and I would get a lot of that kind of stuff because the stuff was just different looking. And I incorporated that into how I designed those costumes. So when people say, oh, that was unique, whatever. But to me, it wasn't unique. It was just something I'd seen in another magazine somewhere. Research, right? The research. That yep. went so that's what I'm saying. People, people should stop just copying but then on the other hand, your whole life you've been told if you want to be successful, do what successful people do. So that means just continuously just copying the same stuff over and over again. When in actuality, what the successful people did was they did something different. That's why they became who they were. Right. You know? Yeah, you have to look beyond just them being successful. You have to look where they started before they were successful. Because that that would give you the proper path that they just did what they wanted to do. You know? Yeah. So, no, good they, point. Good point. You got any, you got any characters with diamond shaped mask on their face? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I do have one with a a mask on, but I have most of mine don't have masks. They're all uh, you can see their face. So here's uh, you can see I have one or two that have a mask on. I don't know if you can see with the glare, sure. but most of them don't. Most of them, their faces right out there. Yeah, that's good looking stuff, man. Thank you. I mean, it's not me. That's my artist Dan, he's he's oh, awesome. So, so this is what it is with the. I can't speak from the. I lost your sound, Larry. Sorry. Say that again. I'm sorry. I can't really speak from the point of view. Written a lot of stuff, but as far as artists, especially guys that've been around for a long time, big name guys, whatever. The one thing we always do is constantly ask ourselves, which thing. There's a lot of people they just do what they feel they're capable of doing and they just leave it at that. And then later on, they're upset because more people aren't paying attention to what they're doing. Whereas we, even when we see a certain level of, of, of fame or whatever, you still are treating yourself the same way. You're like, what can I do to take this thing that I have and make it different and make it better and what it is I'm trying to do? So good. Such good advice. Um, yeah, that's important. Yeah, you're you're talking about some of these styles. Um, you in 1993, right? You have all these incredible characters, whether it's blind spot. Like, are there updates to some of these characters um in issue five that'll look a little bit different? Or are you starting to are you trying to stay true to how they looked in those first four issues? I'm I'm starting off with what we left off with. Perfect, yeah. Then I'm expanding and changing as I go along. 
because you know you pick up a book and you're like oh here's this and you pick up that book all and it's like wait a minute what happened in this book between this and this? yes time went by real time went by but in the continuity of a comic it still has to go from one thing to the next yeah, so we can't put, like I said, we can't put that 30-year gap of age and technology and look just in one single issue just because we decided to be gone for 30 years, you know. <laughs> it's got to, all these transitions of doing new powers or new things or new systems, that will happen over a couple of issues. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. But, but you will, but you will see, you know, some some new characters they haven't, you know, haven't seen and we'll start adding that in. So, we, so we had this one, there was this one of the pages that we're working on where uh, you've kind of gone back in the lives of two of the main characters and when they were younger younger it was uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that far away from that high point in the 70s when people were wearing uh, uh, um, psychedelic pants and bell bottoms and the big heel shoes and all that kind of stuff. So we thought it'd be cool to throw to throw because we remember that around that same time. Oh yeah. I said, no, but if you if, if if you're doing this now, that means all these characters have to be in their sixties and seventies. Yeah, like, so we have to how do we make them look like they're in their twenties and thirties? We have to change the time. Yeah. So what we ended up doing is taking that particular thing and saying, okay, so well, instead of them dressing like this when they were of a certain age, because we liked the way that that, that panel looked. And I said, okay, well, let's just have it where yeah. They've, yeah. They've come, it's Halloween and they're dressed up in Halloween costumes that represent yeah. a certain time period. So that way I don't have to change the drawing <laughs> and it still fits in with what it is that we're doing. Yeah. So, the, so there are going to be some things like that. You still do have to bridge the 30 years in real time because some of the drawing and some of the thoughts we had then are kind of dated. And when you so, think about it, time is one of the biggest problems in comics because so much time, I mean, you're talking about what age would Wetman actually be yeah. if he was the age that he was when he first came out? Mm -hmm. Batman, we've got like in, in his hundreds or something yeah. like that. Spider-Man, you know, you know Nobody wants to see the, you know, Peter Parker trying to pay some bills and do his taxes. <laughs> you, still, you still want these characters, time is always suspended. And then they reboot it every now and then to bring them back. Got it, you know, nobody wants to see the time flowing. So the thing is, when, fan, when comic fans complain about a lot of what they see in books, they don't realize it's a constant process of keeping that stuff updated so that it fits into whatever current, you know, current stuff is. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about how, like, if you look at some of the characters, when we first started reading comics, it was in the 60s, a lot of the characters' origins and history was based on World War II and the Korean War and stuff like that. Then new fans that came the next generation, they started basing the war time was always like Vietnam and stuff like that. Now you see stuff people talking about in Iraq. Yeah, Iraq and stuff like that. So you major things that happen, like like all, look at all the books that were based on the war, you know, the race to the war and they, I mean to the moon, and they met the watcher up there and the red ghost and all that kind of stuff. They don't even talk about that no more. Now they're going to Mars and they, they, they have the fantastic four walking around on the moon, breathing air and all that other kind of stuff. Yeah. Nobody had even been to the moon at that time. So the major things have to be by decades and the major things that happened, just like it's no different than you can't draw New York and have the twin towers and stuff. You know, or you can't, you know, in the old days it used to be the Empire State Building was the main building in the background. That building is nothing. You know, you show all kinds of other buildings where you make up a new building because that's not, that building is not incredible enough. When the first of uh, the modern uh, Spider Man movies came out, there was a preview of Spider Man. He's swinging in between the World Trade Centers and he's webbing, he's webbing. Of course, they had to get rid of that preview and take that out of the movie 
because the World Trade Center didn't exist anymore after, after a yeah. certain point. So, so you have to say, well, what do we do now? We have to figure out some other way of taking this thing and making it fit into all of the modern stuff uh, and have it still make sense. Yeah, and that's you know, you could do that sometimes, and then like like Captain America. They kept him sleep way longer in the new stuff than what really happened when they discovered him in the 60s. It had just been the late 40s. Now he's like 40s all the way. To, I mean, he didn't sleep a lot longer. <laughs> you know, and so it's all that stuff that doesn't make sense if you're still trying to add in more gymnastics and all that. And, you know, it's not as, you know, it's kind of relevant as historically, it's harder to do in comics. You know, so sometimes you have to just kind of avoid major date stamps yeah. and, and create your own stuff, you know. And that's why D.C. does it real well by just they they made up all their major cities. You know, you have Metropolis, Gotham, Star City, Central City, so they can do whatever they want. They can blow up. And you don't care. But, you know, in real, you, know, you could just blow up Philadelphia and act like the world just kept going. And, and, and then you, you know, think of stuff like young in the 60s, the future was the year 2000. Yeah. Year 2000 was like 24 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's the past now. Yep, so every, you know? everything. So like all, all those movies that took place in the year 2000, you almost laugh at it when you see it now. Yeah. It's like, that's a long time ago. Yeah. You know? yeah, have you seen, have you seen, I know this is really off topic, but have you seen this thing where they were talking about that the Jetsons and the Flintstones should be flipped. That the the Jetsons are not the future. The Flintstones are the future really? of the world of the world collapsing after the Jetsons. You know, so they said that that's that's why on the Flintstones they're still trying to use modern technology as people thought it was, like record players and refrigerators and all that kind of stuff. They knew how that the world has been plunged into this. Uh, you you know this horrible times of whatever explosions or whatever happened after the Jetsons. So I thought that was a very interesting concept when you think about it. I'll be you thinking know. about that all day to be honest. Now <laughs> you know now that you think about it, right? They they were they were using they were trying to recreate technology exactly. that possibly they were using before whatever took place took place. Yeah, I, I tell you, I read that and I was like, day. man, that's that's brilliant. <laughs> that's gonna trip me out all day now that I think about it. Yeah, but, but think of this too. Pretty much everything that is being expected to be attacked by aliens from space. We've lived through this in our lifetime. Yeah. Except when it happens, no matter how bad it is, most people just still function and do their normal everyday. Routine or whatever that is, you know. You go outside. I remember when the pandemic thing was at its at its height. I go outside. And it was just empty everywhere. You go into a store. There might have been two, three people in the store, and everybody's faces are covered and all that kind of stuff. And we just went through it. And now here it is. It's, it's almost as if it never happened. And it's still here. Yet it seems like it's never happened because that's just like a long time ago. It was years ago. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> Crazy. You guys oh, say that again, Todd. I lost you. I have to be somewhere at three thirty. You and Larry can keep talking, but look out for try this summer. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Todd. Thank you so much, man. I really it's nice meeting you. Likewise, likewise. Well, Larry, I mean, as we look at Tribe, right, so the idea is that this issue five will be released in uh, the summertime of 2024. Uh, I believe so. Todd's more into the, the, the actual dating of, of stuff. Um, that's that's one of the plans that's going to come out summertime, around yeah. summertime. And will you do like a Kickstarter for this? You're going to go through Kickstarter, like a lot. We don't of know. Yet. We don't know yet. That's more likely that we're going to do that than not. Um, but because of uh, the time that Tribe came out and. The response that we had at the time, there's a number of people who say, hey, if you want to get it published, just come over here. I'll publish it for you. So we're not lacking in somebody publishing it for us. Sure. Yeah. We just have to figure out what's what's be the best deal for us, which is what we did the first time. 
Absolutely. You, you Absolutely. Know, you just figure out, well, what is, what is, you know, you don't just jump to the first person who says they can do something for you. You want to know that in the end, what are you, what are you really getting out of the whole thing? There's so many options now um, for that. Right. So I, I, I would think a lot of publishers would be very excited to to look at Tribe and uh, to revive that after 30 years just because of what it's meant in comic books. I mean, you have a, a pretty but, but, but wait a minute, following, you, right? You, you think of stuff like this, like back when, um, when, when the image guys left, uh, it left Marvel. The deal that we had, at the, that we, we artists had at the time at Marvel, was that whatever a book it is that we did, when everything's done and over with, we would get maybe 2% of what was made from that book. And when you think of it in terms of just kind of publishing your own thing, um, 2% just doesn't seem like very much. That's you know? So when you go and you then publish your own stuff, like I said, you sell less books, but you make more money back from, and then, and then a lot of these guys who are, uh, uh, are generating money as a result of the shows that they do and pre-orders and all that other kind of stuff. Some of these guys don't even sell comics to the comic store and they make more money than they ever did when they were at the big companies. So it's like everything is just different now, you know? I have a... a a friend that I've uh, made over the last year, his name is Danny Quick, and he has a comic oh, book. Yeah, you know Danny? I just I just did a cover for him. Oh, there you go, Larry. I mean, sheesh, that's awesome, man. Well, this guy is killing. It. I call him the TikTok King. He's got a hundred thousand followers, and he is selling like I don't know how many he's selling a week. It, it's none of my business. I don't know if he shared it, but just watching his videos and talking to him, he's done very well off of TikTok. Um, and I know his his comics are in a, a few stores for sure, especially on the East Coast, but he is killing it. He doesn't need a comic book shop to get his title out there. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he's blowing up. I mean, for yeah, people like like you have guys like. Um, um, uh, what can I remember his name? Um, Graham Nolan, guys like Graham, Graham Nolan's doing great. Yeah. Aaron Lepresti, all those guys. They, they, they're creating their own thing, their own world, where they're actually doing better than they would have if, if they if, if they was at one of the big companies. And it's all theirs. <laughs> they get to completely control all of it. Yeah. You know? and, and, and it's great. Yeah. Yeah. I think Graham, I, I had Graham on the show and we were talking his current Kickstarter, I think he's at $35,000 and it still has a couple more weeks. So, yeah, I think he's doing all right. I think he's doing. I think, all right. I think it's. I think it's three times that much now. Is it now? Yeah, I haven't looked at it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So to your point, Larry. I mean, there's just so many opportunities to get the title out there, and um, it's just an exciting time, I think, for comics because of that, right? You, you like don't... I said, the whole self-publishing thing, and yeah. and you now have situations where you didn't have to get 300 copies of a book printed in order for it to be uh, uh, in order for a company to even want to carry print it for you. Now, you know, you have setups where you can get 10 books made if you want to, five books made if you want to. And it's just, I think it's just amazing. All of it's amazing. <laughs> Larry, are you, like, how excited are you about, are you, like, really excited to get back into this and and see these uh, comics come out on a, on a, I don't know, quarterly basis. I'm not sure how many you're going to release or how often you're going to release an issue of Tribe. The thing about it, especially getting older, Yeah. any any and it all comes down to a bunch of work that you have to do. <laughs> I'm not excited about doing the work. Yeah. But I'm excited about the end result of it. Like I, when people would ask me, oh, what's your, what's your favorite part about doing comics? I said, my favorite part is walking into a store and seeing it on a rack. On, on Wednesday when the new comics come out. Yeah. That was that that was probably the most exciting. And next to that would probably be just getting paid, period. But that was always, and it's obviously with me, it's not always about money because if it was, then I would have done a whole lot other things if it was just strictly about doing mo making money. So it's just that satisfaction of walking in there and just seeing it sitting on the shelf with a bunch of other new books that came out. Or, you know, all of the, 
you know, the accolades you get later on, and awards you might get for something, and and praise you get from people who whose stuff you've always loved over the years. When they said, "Oh yeah, I know your stuff. I bought your book." You're like, "What? You buy my book?" He said, "Yeah." It's like, "Oh, that's like that's like the greatest thing in the world." Next thing you know, you go out to dinner with people, and people invite you to the studios to look at some art they're working on, and that is all the part that I I just always loved all that all that part of it. <laughs> Larry, is it possible to look at your body of work and and pick out one thing that you're most proud of, or is that too difficult to do because you've done so much? Like, is there a certain area throughout your career, maybe a title or a character? Yeah. Well, well, the thing is, if you, if you could pick out something that you're most proud of, mm -hmm. then there's no future. Mm. The thing you're always looking for is the future, which means you never actually get to that point where you've hit the end of whatever it is that you're doing, you just want it to be that whatever that next thing is that you're doing is more interesting and more successful than the last thing that you did. <clears throat> and a lot of times the stuff that I've really liked have been, has been stuff that most people never even paid attention to. But that's because that was just some little personal thing for me that I might have wanted. Yeah. And you're just like, well, you know, they didn't really like that. So let me just go back and just do something else. You know, then the next thing comes out and then the next thing, then the next thing. It's it's more about just continuously being able to work yeah. and, and put out stuff. And then that's probably the best part of all of it. Yeah. And well, to know that, you know, I could have a job that at 62, I can still do it along with people who are in their 20s and 30s. <laughs> now, as, as Tribe uh, starts to come out... Um, you know, we talked a little bit before about doing uh, comic cons and stuff like that. Are you going to jump back in a little bit um, to uh, be pushing uh, Tribe Five and and all the other issues after that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I'll always go to comic shows. Not yeah. uh, not as many as I used to, but you know, I'll, I'll still I like I like going to the comic shows because I like just talking to people, yeah, yeah. talking to other artists that I haven't seen in years or people you just don't have much contact with, and and uh, as far as just promoting and selling, that's just a continuous thing. That's not just a, a comic book convention. That's comic book stores. That's that's internet stuff. It's just it's just you're just doing it all the time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Man, like I'm... like I get up this morning, and while he's off in another another place. You know, making calls and figuring out stuff or whatever. I'm drawing this and trying to figure out this, trying to figure out something else, trying to figure out what I'm going to bring when I go to my next show. It's just a continuous. It's a continuous thing. Yeah. And like I like I've told a number of people recently about doing it. I'm like, I'm in a different position than a lot of people in life would be in that. This is what I do for a living. This isn't something I do for fun. I don't do it as their every now and then thing. Every single thing I do is for the purpose of I'm making a living at this, you know. So. Incredible, huh? That uh, with your talent, you've been able to put in the body of work that you have and make a living out of it. Um, I know a lot of people that would love to <laughs> have said they've been able to do that. And, and here you are, Larry. What, a, what an incredible body of work that you've been able to put together and I'm so excited for where Tribe is going to take the next part of your career, man. It's it's pretty incredible. I was talking to my oldest sister, and she was asking me about um, about what was the point in which I decided this is this is what I wanted to do for myself. Mm -hmm. And I said it was it's always been there, always. As a matter of fact, when when our in our neighborhood or our household, when things were at their absolute worst, my mind was just kind of tuned out because I was just sitting there just drawing pictures for the for, for the goal of one day being able to do this stuff for a living. You know? Wow. So my brother, he he used to collect comics and he always had the big Marvel DC posters hung up in his room. And I would look at that stuff and I'm like, man, I sure would love to do that one day. And now and now other people have posters of my stuff up in their up in their room, and they're reading my comic books and and coming to shows and having me sign books. So it's like, 
it's now kind of a complete opposite thing now. <clears throat> I mean, just uh, some of the, the work. I mean, I think everyone knows who you are, Larry. If not, they haven't been reading comics very long. But I mean, some of the titles, Alpha Flight, Ghost Rider, X-Men, X-Factor, uh, Cloak and Dagger. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. The the different. Alien Legion. Yeah, exactly. The titles that you touched, Larry, I mean, I don't know, man. Like if I had your skill set and I was able to do all of these, man, I'd be about, these are the comic books that have meant a lot to me over the last 30 years, right? Because it's an escape for me. It allows me to enter in another world and I don't have to think about whatever's going on around me. Um, even as I get older, I still want that escape. And uh, comic books have always been there for me to have that. I could pull out a, a comic book I've read 10 times and still enjoy it. Um, and uh, I, did a, I did the same thing. I don't read much anymore in comics, but I st it's still the same thing for me. I well, always go back to that stuff. Escape, though, right? In the same huh? way, maybe? maybe drawing is your escape, whereas reading the comics is oh, yeah. drawing. Drawing is drawing's always the escape. Always. <laughs> oh man larry well larry i i can't tell you how much i appreciate you giving me the opportunity to have you on um just an amazing career um i'm so happy for you and todd and and tribe five coming out hopefully this summer sometime uh, i'll be following and doing updates we would love to have you back on to talk well, about it's, it. it's what he didn't say it's actually truck five is just a preview for the graphic novel that we're working on okay because origin the original idea is the graphic novel, but then you have to almost kind of reintroduce things to people all over again. So what we've decided to do is just get do that final story up to a point and then go from that point into the graphic novel, which we eventually go into just new new books, other other new books. Well, that's exciting. That's exciting. And I, I can't wait for that to come out. Um, Larry, if you ever want to come on and talk comics, man, I would love to have you on and it would be amazing Thanks. man, to have you back. But uh, what a what an honor and a pleasure to get to meet you. Um, an amazing career. And it's not over, man. It looks like we're going to have a lot of fun this year with Tribe. And, and you're going to have to somewhere, somewhere or another, you got to find a, a strong guy toy to put in your collection that you got there. I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> I would absolutely let that, Larry. Well, Larry, right. thank, you, thank you so much for joining me today. Can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And uh, I hope you have an amazing rest of the week and weekend. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And thanks yeah. for having Todd, too. Absolutely, my friend. <laughs> All thank right, you. man. Have a good yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs>